Lorna Doon by R. D. Blackmore. My dear father, John Ridd, had been killed by the Doones of Badgery while riding home from Porlock on Exmoor on Saturday evening. Suddenly, a horseman stopped in the starlight full across him. But my father had been used to think that any man who was comfortable inside his own coat and waistcoat deserved to have no other set unless he could strike a blow for them. And so he set his staff above his head and rode at the dune robber. But he was in the midst of a dozen men who seemed to come out of a turf rick, some on horse, some afoot. Nevertheless, he smote lustily as far as he could see. And being of great size and strength, and his blood well up, they had no easy job with him. But a man beyond the range of staff was crouching by the peat stack, with a long gun set to his shoulder, and he got poor father against the sky. And I cannot tell the rest of it. It was more of woe than wonder, being such days of violence, that my mother knew herself a widow, and her children fatherless. Of children, there were only three, none of us fit to be useful yet, only to comfort mother, by making her to work for us. I, John Ridd, was the eldest at twelve years, and felt it a heavy thing on me. Next came Sister Annie, with about two years between us, and then the little Eliza. Good folk who dwell in a lawful land, if such a thing there may be, may judge our neighbourhood harshly, unless the whole truth is set before them. And so I ask leave to explain how and why these robbers came to live in the midst of us. It grew upon us gently in the following manner. In or about the year of our Lord 1640, when all the troubles of England were swelling to an outburst, great estates in the North Country were suddenly confiscated. And through some feud of families and strong influence at court, and the owners were turned upon the world, and might think themselves lucky to save their necks. These estates were in co-heirship, joint tenancy, I think they called it, although I know not the meaning, only so that if either tenant died, the other living, all would come to the live one, in spite of any testament. One of the joint owners was Sir Ensor Doon, a gentleman of brisk intellect, and the other owner was his cousin, the Earl of Lorne and Dykemont. Lord Lorne was some years the elder of his cousin Ensor Doon, and was making suit to gain severance of the cumbersome joint tenancy, by any fair apportionment, when suddenly this blow fell on them, and instead of dividing the land, they were divided from it. The nobleman was still well-to-do, though crippled in his expenditure, but as for the cousin, he was left a beggar, with many to beg from him. He thought that the other had wronged him, and that all the trouble of law befell through his unjust petition. Many friends advised him to make interest at court, for having done no harm whatever, and being a good Catholic, which Lord Lorne was not, he would be sure to find hearing there, and probably some favour. But he, like a very hot-brained man, although he had been long married to the daughter of his cousin, whom he liked none the more for that, would have nothing to say to any attempt at making a patch of it and he drove away with his wife and sons, and the relics of his money, swearing hard at everybody. Some say that in the bitterness of that wrong and outrage, he slew a gentleman of the court, whom he supposed to have borne a hand in the plundering of his fortunes. Others say that he bearded King Charles I himself, in a manner beyond forgiveness. One thing at any rate is sure, Sir Ensor was attained, and made a felon outlaw, through some violent deed ensuing upon his disposition. In great despair at last, he resolved to settle in some outlandish part, where none could be found to know him. And so, in an evil day for us, he came to the west of England. Not that our part of the world is at all outlandish, according to my view of it, for I have never found a better one. But that it was known to be rugged and large and desolate. And here, he had discovered a place which seemed almost to be made for him, so withdrawn, so self-defended, and uneasy of access. There was not more than a dozen of them, counting a few retainers, who still held by Sir Ensor, 
but soon the dunes increased much faster than their honesty. At first, they had brought some ladies with them, of good repute with charity. And then, as time went on, they added to their stock by carrying off many good farmers' daughters. Perhaps their den in that fertile valley might well have been stormed, and themselves driven out of the forest, if honest people had only agreed to begin with them at once, when first they took to plundering. But having respect for their good birth and pity for their misfortunes, and perhaps a little admiration of the justice of God, that robbed men now were robbers, the squires and the farmers and shepherds at first did nothing more than grumble gently, or even make a laugh of it, each in the case of others. After a while, they found the matter gone too far for laughter, as violence and deadly outrage stained the hand of robbery, until every woman clutched her child, and every man turned pale at the very name of Doon. I was turned fourteen years old when I first went to explore the Badgery water. My mother had long been ailing and not well able to eat much, and there is nothing that frightens us so much as for people who have no love of their victuals. Now I chanced to remember that once at the time of the holidays I had brought dear mother from Tiverton a jar of pickled loaches, caught by myself in the Lerman River and baked in the kitchen oven with vinegar, a few leaves of bay and about a dozen peppercorns. And my mother had said that in all her life she had never tasted anything fit to be compared with them. So now, being resolved to catch some loaches, whatever trouble it cost me, I set forth without a word to anyone. In the forenoon of St Valentine's Day, 1675 or 6, I think it must have been. I never could forget that day and how bitter cold the water was, for I doffed my shoes and hose and put them into a bag about my neck and so went into the pebbly water, trying to forget how cold it was. When I had travelled two miles or so, suddenly, in an open space, where meadows spread about it, I found a good stream flowing softly into the body of our brook, gliding smoothly and forcibly, as if upon some set purpose. Now all the turn of my life hung on that moment. It seemed a sad business to go back now, and to tell my mother there were no loaches, and yet it was a frightful thing, knowing what I did of it, to venture where no grown man durst, up the badgery water. However, my spirit arose within me, so I went stoutly up under the branches which hang so dark on the badgery river. Here, although affrighted often by the deep, dark places, and feeling that every step I took might never be taken backward, on the whole I had a very comely sport of loaches, trout and minnows, forking some and tickling some, and driving others to shallow nooks whence I could bail them ashore. Till suddenly I saw that the day was falling fast behind the brown of the hilltops, and the trees being void of leaf and hard seemed giants ready to beat me. And every moment, as the sky was clearing up for a white frost, the cold of the water got worse and worse, until I was fit to cry with it. And so, in a sorry plight, I came to an opening in the bushes, where a great black pool lay in front of me, whitened with foam froth. Skirting round one side, with very little comfort, because the rocks were high and steep, and the ledge at the foot so narrow, I came to a sudden sight and marvel, such as I never dreamed of. For lo, I stood at the foot of a long, pale slide of water, coming smoothly to me, without any break or hindrance, for a hundred yards or more, and fenced either side with cliff, sheer and straight and shining. What prevented me from turning back was a strange, inquisitive desire, very unbecoming in a boy of little years. Therefore, I girt up my breeches anew, bestowed my fish around my neck more tightly, and not stopping to look much, for fear of fear, crawled along over the fork of rocks, where the water had scooped the stone out, and shunning thus the ledge from whence it rose, like the mane of a white horse, into the broad black pool, softly I let my feet into the dip and rush of the torrent. How I went carefully, step by step, keeping my arms in front of me and never daring to straighten my knees, is more than I can tell clearly, or even like to think of, because it makes me dream of it. I laboured hard with both legs and arms, going like a mill and grunting, 
until at last the rush of forked water, where first it came over the lips of the fall, drove me into the middle, and I stuck a while with my toe balls on the slippery links of the popweed, and the world was green and glittery, and I durst not look behind me. Then I made up my mind to die at last, for so my legs would ache no more, and my breath not pain my heart so. Only it did seem such a pity, after fighting so long, to give in, and the light was coming upon me, and again I fought towards it. Then suddenly I felt fresh air, and fell into it headlong. When I came to myself again, my hands were full of young grass and mould, and a little girl kneeling at my side was rubbing my forehead tenderly with a dock leaf and a handkerchief. Oh, I am so glad, she whispered softly as I opened my eyes and looked at her. Now you will try to be better, won't you? I had never heard so sweet a sound as came from between her bright red lips. While there she knelt and gazed at me, neither had I ever seen anything so beautiful as the large dark eyes intent upon me, full of pity and wonder, and the black shower of her hair where it fell on the turf, among it like an early star, the first primrose of the season. What is your name? she said, as if she had every right to ask me. And how did you come here? My name is John Ridd, I said. What is your name? Lorna Doon, she answered in a low voice, as if afraid of it and hanging her head, so that I could see only her forehead and eyelashes. If you please, my name is Lorna Doon. I thought you must have known it. I stood up and touched her hand and tried to make her look at me, but she only turned away the more. Do you know what they would do to us if they found you here with me? Beat us, I dare say, very hard, or me at least. They could never beat you. No, they would kill us both outright and bury us here by the water, and the water often tells me that I must come to that. But what would they kill me for? Because you have found the way up here, and they never could believe it. Now please go, oh please go. They would kill us both in a moment. Yes, I like you very much, for I was teasing her to say it. Very much indeed. And I will call you John Ridd, if you like. Only please go, John. But I tell you, Lorna, I like you very much indeed. Nearly as much as my sister Annie, and a great deal more than Lizzie. And I never saw anyone like you. And I must come back again tomorrow, and so must you to see me. Only put your hand in mine. Hush! A shout came down the valley, and all my heart was trembling, and Lorna's face was altered from pleasant play to terror. She shrank to me and looked up at me with such a power of weakness that I at once made up my mind to save her or to die with her. And the little girl took courage from me and put her cheek quite close to mine. I will tell you what to do. They're only looking for me. You see that hole? That hole there? And she pointed to a little niche in the rock which verged the meadow about fifty yards away from us. In the fading of the twilight I could just see it. Yes, I see it. But they will see me crossing the grass to get there. Look, look! She could hardly speak. There is a way out from the top of it. They would kill me if I told it. Oh, here they come. I can see them. The little maid turned as white as snow, and she cried, Oh dear, oh dear! And she began to sob aloud, being so young and unready. But I drew her behind the withy bushes, and close down to the water, where it was quiet, and shelving deep, ere it came to the lip of the chasm. Crouching in that hollow nest, as children together in ever so little compass, I saw a dozen fierce men come down, on the other side of the water, not bearing any firearms, but looking lax and jovial, as if they were come from riding and a dinner taken hungrily. Queen! Queen! They were shouting here and there and now and then. Where the pest is our little queen gone? 